Okay, integration management. Um, today um, I'm going to be talking about um, integration management for new build FLNG facilities. There's been a lot of discussions um, the last few days about conversions. I was interested what um, uh, Duncan was talking about this morning uh, when we talk about risk. As far as integration management goes, I think you, uh, you have lots of risks and lots of exposure uh, for managing the interfaces for new builds. I think when you're looking at conversions, that uh, becomes even more critical. Um, and you may ask, why is that? Uh, the reason I see is that when you are doing a new build, you've done your feed, you're, you're prepared, you've, you, you know the scope of work, and you may have some areas which are known uh, unknowns that you're, you're prepared for, you've made some contingency for. But when you're looking at, uh, at uh, conversions, um, many times you start the work, and then you find that you haven't even thought about an issue or a problem that's, that's happened, and that causes massive issues um, for uh, integration and for um, interface. Okay, uh, first, just have a quick um, overview about JGC. Uh, we're based in uh, beautiful Yokohama. Um, JGC uh, was established in 1928. Uh, we have a turnover roughly around about $7 billion um, last year. We have experience in over 80 countries. Our group manpower, our base manpower, is roughly around about 10,000, uh, based with uh, roughly 5,000 uh, in Japan and 4,900, 5,000 uh, overseas. Our specialty um, is lump sum uh, turnkey contracts. Okay, a little bit of history about JGC. I won't go into all of these projects, um, but as you can see, we have uh, quite a history in LNG uh, and recently in FLNG. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, if you look at our history here, back in 1973, we were involved in LNG projects. So that means we have a very good idea about LNG projects. And for the last 15, 20 years, we have been focusing on moving into FPSO and FLNG. Okay, uh, back in 1990, um, the, uh, the corporation decided that we would uh, have a step change. We would start focusing on uh, FPSO and FLNG. That took probably uh, approximately about 10 years before we actually started uh, being involved in any projects. The first, uh, the first couple was the Balanac uh, and the Senna LPG FPSO projects. Um, in 2008, 2009, we were involved with um, the Shell GFLNG uh, concepts and our involvement. We were involved in many studies and pre-feed projects. Of note, we have been involved in the Petrobras FLNG, Petronas uh, FLNG. Uh, recently, Marcella, uh, we completed that last year. And uh, very recently, we completed the e and uh, Mozambique Coral um, feed project, and of course now we're, we're in negotiations for uh, EPC. Uh, and from EPC side, Petronas PFLNG, uh, which is currently, last week started steel cutting in, in Samsung. Um, of interest, one of the things I, I, when I've been talking to people uh, this, uh, the last few days is uh, people said, well, we didn't know that you had a dedicated FLNG division. Uh, I can tell you that we do. Uh, six years ago, JDC decided that it wanted to uh, get quite serious about FLNG. Uh, it realised that it needed expats and um, um, outside resources so that it could then migrate from onshore LNG to offshore. So six years ago, um, we, uh, we created a core group. I was part of that group. Um, we get involved with every project, every FLNG project, every F FPSO um, concept or, or uh, review project. Uh, we sometimes are based uh, in Yokohama. Uh, it really depends on the, the, the project and the project requirements. For the Marcella project, many of us were actually located to Jakarta. For Petronas PFLNG, most of the people in our group are providing our support 
also for the ENI uh, FLNG feed. Uh, we provided a lot of support uh, to Technip, who is the uh, feed leader. Okay, just a quick look at the, the current recent project, projects. Uh, Impex Abadi uh, completed last year. We're not sure where that's going to go. Petronas PFLNG. Um, at the time, this was the third EPCIC award of FLNG. Uh, and interestingly and important to us, it's the first FLNG contract awarded to a Japanese company. We're very proud of that fact. And Enai Mozambique, which we are currently in uh, contract negotiations. Okay, so um, let's get on to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the main topic. Integration management. So I'm going to have a look today at uh, a few issues. Um, integration management principles. Um, integration in practice. I'm going to look at management structures and organisational issues because I believe they have a big impact in how we uh, conduct uh, integration management and interface management. And then I'm going to uh, uh, summarise with some uh, strategies and ideas that we need, that we should think about um, when we are developing our FLNG projects. Okay, I get this question, these three questions all the time. What is integration management? What is interface management? And is there a difference between the two? To answer the last question, there's a very big difference between the two. Integration management is managing the various project management elements of a project. And when I talk about the project management elements of a project, I talk about formal project management practices where we're talking about scope management, time management, procurement management, communications management, and all those sort of things. Then we have interface management, which is managing the work scope that involves multiple parties and activities that cross one or more boundaries. Okay, so let's, uh, let's have a look at a couple of examples. Here we have um, a, a typical scope and responsibility um, high-level chart. We have a look at the facility management, which may be done by the owner-operator. Top size engineering uh, and engineering subcontracts may be done by the prime EPC contractor. Module yard may uh, be done by a module contractor under the EPC contractor, but still a separate entity. For the whole storage and LQ, we typically would go to a shipyard to, to look at those sort of things. Turret and mooring, we talk to our, our turret supplier. You obviously have class, and we may have a surf contractor. You may have many other um, interfaces, but let's just look at those uh, at the moment. So when we look at that, what do we see? Is this integration management, or is this interface management? The interesting thing is this actually comes from an interface management document. But I would say that contract agreements and the setting and the definition of the respective scope of work is integration management. It's done by the senior management. I would say the overall management of the respective organisations and the management structures of those organisations is part of integration management. And I would say the effort needed to manage the boundaries set once the first two have been uh, put in place the people and the scope of work, is where we talk about interface management. I think this is very important when you start putting on an organisation chart, what does an interface manager do? Okay, so um, integration management principles. Uh, some people say, you know, we have, what, is, what is integration management? Um, there is a formal uh, process for integration management. Uh, PMI, the Project Management Institute, um, talks about uh, within the project, manager, project management book, uh, body of knowledge. It talks about what a, a, a project management team um, should be looking at and how to focus on integration management. So this is, this is taken directly from PMBOK. So project in, uh, integration management includes the processes and activities to identify, to combine, to unify and coordinate the various processes and project management activities within the project management process groups. I think if you think about what does an interface manager do, does he have control over those issues at a high level? I don't think so. 
Also, uh, Pimbok talks about uh, what does integration management include. Uh, it includes characteristics of unification, consolidation, communication, integrative actions, and this is done through successfully managing stakeholder expectations, meeting project requirements, effective resource allocation, making trade-offs among competing objectives and alternatives, and managing the interdependencies among the project management knowledge areas. Again, this is higher level project management responsibility. Yet, as an interface manager on projects, I tend to be la uh, labelled to uh, manage some of these issues which are outside the realm of uh, an interface manager's responsibility. Okay, so I would say that uh, if you want to summarise integration man management, it's understanding the scope of work, it's understanding your partners, your subcontractors, vendors, their respective scope of work. Really important is understanding their skills and expertise and how it applies um, to your project and to the scope of work that you assign to them. Understanding of how all the elements of the project management work together and working in proactive collaboration with each other. Another issue I'd like to add to that is expert judgment. I have seen a lot of integration management and a lot of interface management fail because we put young project managers or inexperienced people into these roles. Expert judgment, you need you know, an older head uh, to have a look at some of these issues. And you need that because you need to understand the scope of work so you have some experience. You need to understand your partners. That's very hard to do if you're very young and you have had limited experience. You have to understand all the elements of project management. You, can't, you don't have that level of experience when you're quite junior. Um, and working in proactive collaboration, well, that's very easy if you have a project that's in your hometown. You know, but if you are new to the industry, a new project manager, a new interface manager, and you're working in a Korean yard, a Chinese yard, and whatever, those cultural um, uh, aspects, organisational aspects, you may never experience those, and suddenly you're involved with managing those. So expert judgement and knowledge. Okay, so um, just, to, just to have a quick look at um, you know, high level split of work and responsibilities that I see all the time. So across the top here we have um, all the different elements, so detail engineering, procurement, uh, whatever. And then uh, we have all the, um, uh, here we're just talking about the four main elements. Obviously there are many more. So we may say that um, the project management leadership is done by the EPC contractor, and the EPC contractor may look after the top sites. The EPC contractor may also look after the towing, uh, the hookup commissioning, etc. You may have a shipyard that's uh, looking after, um, obviously, the hull and the living quarters. But nowadays, uh, many shipyards uh, want to be involved in the topsides modularisation and integration. Um, they typically involved in the turret mooring system and integrating that within the yard. You may have your TMS contractor that is looking at certain elements of. Um, design engineering and uh, uh, integration and then of course you may have your sub C which has its own uh, full set of uh, uh, scope going from detail design to uh, startup and, and uh, uh, operations. So when we look at that we, we look at well who's responsible, what, what, what's the definitions of, of the responsibility so I would say when we're looking at the owner operators, we, they have a responsibility to define exactly what is expected from the project. I'll have a talk about contracts in a minute. EPC contractors have a responsibility to understand this requirement and implement the process and practices that facilitate effective integration. This includes requirements of class, marine warranty, supply, um, marine warranty suppliers, etc. And this, even if these are not in your contract, you still have a responsibility to understand them. The shipyards and module yards have a responsibility to be actively involved in the process um, and make sure that their concerns are heard. Uh, typically, module yards, shipyards, you give them a scope of work, uh, they're, they're happy to accept the work, they're happy to quote for the work, um, and then you say, okay, that's fantastic. But have they really understood the work? Vendors and suppliers, uh, one of the lessons learnt from, uh, from FPSOs is that uh, 
within the FLNG industry, we see many vendors and suppliers now understand that they have a responsibility to understand the dynamics of the project they are involved with. It's not just providing equipment. And be proactive when it comes to such things as product compliance, witness testing, etc. So even if you haven't specified that, if you have an active vendor and supplier, then they then can provide some input uh, and some experience. Uh, as we talked before, um, integration management um, as a formal process talks about scope, time, quality, human resource and communication risk. As I mentioned before, if you don't have some expertise um, and experience, what happens? You get up, you get, end up with this sort of situation. Basically an angry mob outside your door saying what is going to happen. Um, we've talked about um, some lessons learnt that we've, um, that have come from the FPSO industry. Um, there's good news and there's bad news. This is uh, an article of, um, from Offshore Engineering in December, just, just last December, uh, by Will Leonard of ABB. Catchy headline, mega projects, mega headaches. Um, when I saw this, I thought, oh, here we go again. Yeah. FPSO, lessons learned, what has been learned? Interesting um, comment within this article was, among the internal areas of failure identified by the report are poor procurement um, of contracts, poor contractor management, and ineffective project management. This is really the heart of integration management and interface management. Thankfully, the industry is talking about how in this new FLNG industry, how we are going to move forward. Um, I was uh, met with Francis Norman of Engineers Australia. They, uh, they created a, a report last year in December uh, on the challenges for FLNG. It was very encouraging to see that in the section five, hurdles to overcome, they talked about establishing a truly collaborative environment in industry and in general and in the emerging FLNG sector specifically not, will not be without its challenges. And then it went on to, to other areas. This is the area of integration management and, and interface management. Okay, another area I'd like to talk about is common sense. As an interface manager, integration manager, you go to lots of meetings and it can get very heated at times when people are saying, this just does not make sense. I don't understand what you're talking about. Common sense, uh, I think we need to appreciate what, what it is. It's deeply influenced on where you live in the world, your experiences, um, your culture, um, and the levels of common sense and critical thinking vary, great, uh, vary greatly uh, between individuals and organisations. I'll give you a, a, an interesting example. I grew up in country New South Wales. In country New South Wales, we have lots of snakes. So when I was a child, my, uh, my dad would say, go out and get some wood. So I'd go out, get some wood. When I went to the stockpile, I'd kick the stockpile. I'd wait a couple of minutes. Then I'd grab some wood. Why did I do that? Because in Australia, we have deadly snakes. It's common sense. It's common knowledge in the country. You do that, the snakes hear the sound, they run away. A couple of, when I grew up, I was maybe 23, 24. Uh, in England, working in England. I went to uh, uh, a friend's house uh, on the farm. Big party. Ron, go get, go get some wood. So off I go, it's raining. I go out to the wood pile, I kick the wood pile, I wait in the rain. I then get the wood and I bring it back in. Everybody is laughing. What are you doing? To me, it was common sense. You kick a wood pile, you know, from my upbringing, my cultural upbringing, where I lived, it was very common sense. My English friends thought it was extremely funny. It did not make any sense at all. So when we're, we're working in an industry that has many cultural environments, we have to think about common sense. FLNG projects are global projects. They require understanding of and cooperation with our world parties that are spread across different cultural environments. They include people in organisations with different ideas and different upbringings who implement various local mythologies to achieve their corporate and financial objectives. So therefore, why is it not uh, acceptable 
that our world partners may have different views on common sense. Okay, I'd like to um, have a look at a couple of key issues. Uh, one is the contract document, the other is the scope of work. Uh, within contracts, I've been involved in uh, contracts review management for, for many, many years. I'm quite surprised that even today, within contracts, there is no paragraph talking about integration management. I'll give you some examples. These are actual examples from actual contract documents. Contractors shall provide all necessary management, coordination and administration services necessary for the overall completion of the work to company satisfaction to the project execution schedule. Okay, it talks about all necessary management. It doesn't talk about integration management anywhere. Another clause in another section of the contract document. Contractor shall initiate and implement appropriate procedures so that the work is executed in an efficient and effective manner. I would say that that really is part of integration management. It involves some aspects of interface management. It doesn't talk about that. What is interesting is that almost every contract we see nowadays has a huge section on interface management. Here's a, a section from the interface management section within the document. The contractor shall be responsible for identifying and effectively managing all the interfaces. Okay, so now you've said we're going to have an interface manager. He's going to be totally responsible for this. But at the higher level of the project, there's no integration management requirement or it's just left to you to decide. That means there is a gap. If you look at a typical organisation structure, the in interface manager is not at the top level of that organisation structure. So there is a gap. Okay, so um, integration management, I would say, is a conscious senior, senior level commitment to proactively manage, work with and integrate all stakeholder elements such as project management practices, organisational practices, etc. It's multi-directional in that it flows across all of the stakeholders and flows down to other managerial and technical levels within the project and within each organisation. And this is irrespective of the structure of the organisation. Interface manager is typically led by, uh, sorry, interface management is typically led by an interface manager who is not typically at the same level of authority as the senior project managers and project directorate. However, interface management is the effort needed to manage the work, the scope, the people and, and the respective boundaries defined and set by those responsible for integration management. And interface management manages the technical aspects of the design and build across the interface boundaries. So let's have a look at scope of work in a practical situation. Uh, I could actually talk about scope of work uh, for days. So here's, here's a, um, a section cut out of a document. I saw this many years ago when I was working on FPSO projects and I still see it today working on FLNG. Um, the scope, I've just randomly picked some scope. Um, so if we have a look here, let's pick an area, say the uh, piping design stress analysis. So here we'll have, um, in the document, we may have these three different entities. Let's assume that entity number one is, say, the EPC contractor. Uh, let's assume entity number three uh, is a shipyard. And let's assume entity number two is, say, the turret manufacturer. So here we've talked about respective scope of work. What does that mean? A lot of people look at this and say, well, it's obvious. You know, the, the, the EPC contractor, if he's responsible for top sides, looks at the top sides piping design. The shipyard, for example, may look at the piping design associated with the shipyard. And the turret manufacturer may look at the piping design elements with the turret. Does that work? No. It doesn't work because we haven't defined exactly where the interface boundaries are in this, within this high level document. Um, and typically what happens is this becomes the contract document and the definition of the scope of work and it is then left to the interface manager to then try to manage what that means. So what happens then is the interface manager will then take these scopes of work, they will then sit down with each of the parties and actually go through what is actually defined in the scope of work. That ends up being a very um, um, 
complicated matter because when you are redefining elements within the scope of work, you need senior management approval of those organisations. The, the interface manager doesn't have that, that level of authority. Okay, I'll quickly uh, I'll talk about management structures and organisational issues. Um, management structures, we have um, um, many different structures in the, in the um, um, uh, entities that are involved in FLNG. You can have silo organisations, matrix organisations, projectized organisations, and resulting from those you can have organisational issues. So what, I, what do I mean when I'm talking about that? Uh, for the project managers, they'll, they'll understand this. Um, you can have, within um, a management structure, you can have a projectized type structure, a strong matrix structure. These structures allow the project manager to have quite a lot of authority, have quite a lot of resources available, um, have effect over budget. You can have other organisations at this end of the scale, which can be a weak matrix or a silo organisation, which may have little or no um, authority, management authority within those organisations. This becomes a functional management organisation. So what does that mean in the real world, in real uh, FLNG projects? So here we uh, I've just put a table together. We have a look at the owner-operator, EPC contractor, shipyard and fabrication yard. The owner-operator could be a, a very strict projectized organisation. The EPC contractor, a large project, you may have uh, a joint venture. So you could end up with a, bat a balanced matrix structure for one organisation and a strong matrix organisation for another. A shipyard could be a functional or silo-based organisation, and you may have one or more fabrication or construction yards, which could be, um, let's say, a, a weak matrix or a strong matrix organisation. Sorry. So what does this mean when we're looking at interface management and integration management? What it means is you really have to understand those structures to effectively manage your project. If you come from a, a strong projectized um, strong matrix structure and you have never worked in a silo based structure and you're starting an FLNG project, you're in trouble uh, because you really won't understand how a functional management structure works. So you need to understand when you start your projects and I would say when we're talking about risk mitigation, this should be discussed right at concept stage This should be, you know, and then re-evaluated in feed stage and definitely not left until EPC stage to try to work out how we're actually going to manage these structures. There are ways to over, overcome structural challenges. One is uh, create good relationships with your functional managers. Uh, two is to develop strong situational awareness. Again, I think you need some expert knowledge and experience to do that. Uh, you need to know the strengths as well as the weaknesses um, so that you can harbour a relationship that can overcome any weaknesses. Um, and you, you should use experience to influence power in a relationship. You should definitely never use authority to power a relationship. I think this is a very key issue. Okay, um, one of the things I'd like to, to quickly show you is, here we have a, uh, a typical management structure. And what is this structure? This is a projectized or strong matrix structure. When you put together a bid as an EPC um, contractor, this is what the client wants, but is it what you actually have? Uh, if you put together a management structure that shows a functional organisation for your shipyard, um, a matrix organisation, weak matrix organisation for your fabrication yard, uh, and a strong matrix organisation um, for your EPC contractor, the, the company doesn't want to look at that. They just want to have a look at a projectized uh, management structure. And this causes problems because these go into the contract documents that win you the feed and win you uh, the EPC contractor contract. Unfortunately, they're not the reality of the situation that you'll actually experience when you're running the project. Okay, quickly um, talking about some organisational issues. Uh, project organisations are heavily influenced by the management structure. Organisational issues are inherently a result of the management structure and project teams need to be aware of potential organisational issues. One of the questions I always ask when I'm invited to uh, be involved in a project is how does the organisational behaviour and the cultural influences affect the project and what does this have on execution of work? This is a very important point when you're talking you know, cross-cultural projects. 
From that, we end up with common issues. We have company strategy and culture, organisational structural issues, organisational commitment and individual commitment issues, leadership issues. If we're in a functional um, arrangement, you can have a very effective meeting with a senior uh, manager within a functional group, but uh, if that is a shipyard and the yard manager has not approved that work, that was a complete waste of time. So you need to look at leadership. Um, as I said before, if you have uh, the organisational structure where you've said the project manager is responsible and you've agreed that with your client, uh, you're in you know, a few challenges. Uh, motivation. Motivation depends on uh, a, a lot of issues. Cross-functional and vertical functional organisations. Goal setting is, a, is a, an important issue. Um, some companies uh, uh, and some project managers are, are very uh, focused into goal setting. Power distance, conflict management uh, and language. Uh, many of our, uh, our colleagues, their first language is not English uh, and when you provide uh, complicated um, contracts uh, or badly worded scopes of work such as respective scope of work, you lose a lot in translation. Okay, so from this, um, whenever um, I'm involved in any projects, uh, I like to ask five key questions. What constitutes the project management environment in the various locations for the design, construction and test of the, of the project? How do those environments influence the project management methodologies and practices in those locations, and in particular the way integration management is achieved? What constitutes the major organisational environment in the vari various locations? How do those organisational environments I influence the general management practices and, in particular, the way that that affects integration management? And how uh, do the project management environment and the organisational environment interact to influence the way that um, integration management is achieved? From those five questions, I would suggest that uh, five uh, basic strategies. First is review of the contract document and the scope of work in terms of uh, how the scope will be practically integrated and managed with all the parties involved on your FLNG project. I see uh, quite common nowadays is that because we're trying to reduce risk, we're trying to reduce liability, we're trying to share liability, we simply say, oh, let's package uh, this element of the work uh, to, say, a shipyard, and they're fully responsible, and then we walk away. It doesn't work because, in the end, uh, you, get, uh, you get involved with that. If you haven't talked about how you're going to practically integrate that work, uh, you're going to have some issues. Um, be proactive. Investigate what management structures will actually be implemented in the, in the various locations. Seek out and try to understand the organisational structures in the various locations. Proactively plan for the challenges of the various parties' management structures and organisation structures. If you have never worked in a shipyard um, or have never worked um, on a project that has involved uh, a fabrication yard, go out and have a, have a talk to those people and uh, you know, start learning how they actually do their work. Don't just assume that they will follow your, your various project management structure and organisational structures. And don't assume what you consider to be common sense is actually that common. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. Any questions for Thank you for sharing these um, um, facts. And we would like to know how you manage to, um, to manage the inter integration management uh, for example, how we can um, control the interfaces, make, uh, how we make sure these responsibilities roles are being um, in implemented by various parties. Do you have some um, specific type of uh, uh, metrics uh, management or interface management uh, means uh, you would like to share with us? Um, okay. Um, I think basically we need to go back to the contract documents and the scope of work documents. I came from a commissioning background, so when I look at scope of work and what, uh, what work is going to be done, I would uh, have a look at the, um, the PFDs, the P&IDs. When you're commissioning a project, you break the work down and you set up your, your, uh, your scope. 
why not do that for integration management? Don't just put a line on a drawing or a line in the contract and say that's their work and then walk away. Have a look at actually how that work is going to be done and then have a look at what the actual physical interface boundary um, is and the scope of work boundary is between the entities. believe you will have some regular uh, interface meetings or metrics or uh, interface data to, because at various parties, at least three or four parties will be sharing or reviewing the same data. Uh, how that been, as you mentioned earlier, you shared one of the metrics is everybody having the same responsibility, which doesn't work. Um, how do you clean it up? And is there something you could um, uh, have give us some Okay, yeah, within, uh, within interface management, you create an interface management procedure. Um, you define the interface management boundaries. You define the scopes of work. Um, you then, um, with, within that interface management procedure, you then look at how you're going to manage those boundaries by putting interface manager in place, um, interface coordinators in place in the different various locations, and then you have regular meetings and regular discussions on what is happening within a project and are there any issues. If you discover any issues, then there's a formal interface uh, management uh, procedure. There's um, you know, document control, yeah, a, a formal document uh, management um, process that you can have. You assign uh, an interface issue to um, as, a, as a discrete um, uh, activity. You assign people to work at that, whether it's one or two parties. And then you work with those parties to try to resolve that, that uh, issue and then you log that issue and then report it back. Yeah, um, this is very pertinent to, I would say, all uh, large projects. I was wondering whether there are specific in, uh, issues that come up uh, with relation to FLNG. You know, say, for example, where the, uh, the uh, liquefaction contractor is meeting the shipyard and uh, anything coming out of those kind of interfaces. Um, I think one of the things that we specifically have in, in LNG is we have a lot of people coming from um, the onshore LNG experience. Um, those people don't have a lot of experience in, in offshore and they don't have a lot of experience in um, how to modulise um, um, certain components. So what you find is that when you bring, um, say, um, uh, a process integrator or, or a, a scope of work, a modularization um, scope of work together, is if they haven't worked in an offshore environment, they've only worked on an onshore facility, they do have some challenges, particularly with weight management, uh, with size and scope management, um, and, and culturally. Um, we are forced in FLNG to work uh, with, a, with a lot of different parties all around the world. Um, and you have to really understand those people and, and those organisations and structures to be able to do that. Any other questions? Uh, you referred to it a couple of times, but would you like to enlarge a bit on uh, language within a multinational project? Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, in, in most contracts, offshore pro, um, contracts, we talk about the contract is based in, you know, the language is, is English, uh, based on English law. Um, when you are working, um, say you, you are maybe uh, studying your, your test in integration, um, and say that's in a Korean shipyard, um, you may have written all your procedures in English, but the people doing the work, the actual people doing the work, um, may have different various levels of experience in understanding um, English as a written word or understanding it as a, as a verbal communication. The managers may know that very well um, and the senior engineers and, and may, not, may know that very well. But what I find is a lot of people don't take the time to hear back what they have said um, to somebody. Um, so I, th I think when you're talking to um, entities that have um, English as a uh, as it's not their primary language. You need to first write down what, what you're talking about. You need to then communicate that back to say, is that exactly what you understand the situation to be? 
I find that a lot in many of my interface management meetings. People think, oh, that meeting's finished, it's all decided. I always say, wait a minute, now you explain it to me. Just one question, Ron. Um, in the FPSO world, it's becoming quite a challenge and so far. There's a lot of projects being uh, overrun through schedules because of a lack of integration management, but also through the kind of discrepancy be uh, between the oil companies, the FPS contractors, and the shipyards when it comes to specifications. Um, and there's a lot of back and forth. Um, does that happen in the FLNG, uh, having worked on certain projects so far? Um, <laughs> uh, absolutely. Um, it, it's, it's, the, it's the same issues. You know, if you haven't defined in the contract exactly what you want to do, if you haven't defined the scope of work, if you said a respective scope of work, that's very unclear. Um, if you have just assumed in meetings and discussions that you know, people understand what you want to do. Um, if you just assume, even if you have worked with, I mean, we've worked with um, like Samsung, for example, many, many times. Um, I would never assume when I ask them something that they would um, accept that they instantly understand what I mean. Because you'll be working with different people and different parts of the organisation. So I think um, I see a lot of the same issues.